Now it's really important that you understand that heat is not the same as temperature. Heat is a type of energy and as such it's measured in joules. Temperature, well the GCSE definition is a bit wishy-washy, it's the hotness of an object and it's measured in degrees Celsius at GCSE. At A level we measure it in Kelvin. Now these units are very very similar but Kelvin is far superior because we can do more with it. But for now we're just going to stick with degrees Celsius. If you really want to know what it actually is, it's actually how fast particles are vibrating in an object. Now don't get me wrong, the more heat you put into something, the higher the temperature gets, but they are not the same thing. Is there a way to tell how much the temperature of something goes up by if we put so much heat in? Yes, there is. We can say that energy is equals to mass, because of course, the bigger something is, the more that energy is going to spread out, times the change in temperature, and that's measured in degrees C, kilograms is a unit for mass. Now I'm gonna put a delta in front of here. Delta, if you haven't seen this before, means change in energy, or change in anything. So we have a change in energy. We're putting energy in or taking energy out and we're causing a change in temperature. So we're missing something here, something that's gonna be specific for a certain material. You might or might not know that if you give one kilogram of iron a thousand joules and you give one kilogram of water a thousand joules, they're actually not going to end up at the same temperature. What do we call this thing that we're missing in here? We call it specific heat capacity. And the units of this, well, if we rearrange it, we get joules per kilogram per degree C or joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Or we can call this SHC for short. SHC, the textbook definition is the energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Or one degree Kelvin is the same thing in this case. Now for water, SHC is 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree C. In other words, if you have a kilogram of water and you want to raise the temperature from say 20, 21 degrees C, so you're raising the temperature by one degree C, you need 4,200 joules of energy. Now it is possible for you to be given an SHC in terms of joules per gram per degree C. So just be careful, if you're given an SHC in joules per gram instead, then you need to measure mass in grams, not kilograms. But that should be fairly obvious with the question that you're given. If that's the case, the SHC would actually be just 4.2 joules per gram per degree C for water in that case. So how could you calculate the SHC for a material then? Well, let's have a look at our equation again. An alternative version of this equation, if you're doing A-level, is actually delta Q, because Q is heat at A-level, gonna be MC. That's the symbol that we give to SHC. Delta theta, theta again usually is an angle, but in this case it means temperature. Energy, mass, SHC, change in temperature. So let's say that we wanted to find out the specific capacity for a material. Now we could use this for any material really, um, whether it be a liquid or a solid, but let's try and find out the specific capacity of uh, iron. So what we do is we get an iron block like that and what we do is uh, weigh it on a balance and find out the mass. And uh, we also have a thermometer that's put in there as well. And we can have a little bit of water in the hole as well to make sure that it's the right temperature. What we then have is a heater that we put inside of this block. And this heater is attached to a battery or a power pack. And uh, we're gonna have an ammeter as well. And obviously we're going to have a voltmeter as well so we can uh, measure the voltage across this heater. Now we know that power supplied by a battery is equals to voltage times current, or P equals VI. 
To turn this into energy, energy supplied, all we need to do is times this by the number of seconds that it's on for. So it's just going to be V I times T voltage across the heater times the current times the time. So long as you've got a constant voltage or potential difference and current, then you can find out how much energy is supplied to the block by the heater. Now we've got to be careful here because we know that some of the energy is going to be lost to the surroundings. So you have to take this value with a pinch of salt, but it's a good opportunity to talk about sources of uncertainty and uh, how you might improve the experiment in the future, like insulation, that kind of thing. So once you have this amount of energy that's been supplied to the block, we know that that has to be the same as the energy needed to raise the temperature of the block. If you know the mass and you know the change in the temperature, all you have to do then is rearrange for the specific heat capacity. So the specific heat capacity of something, C or SHC, doesn't matter how you write it, is going to be equal to the change in energy divided by the mass times the change in temperature. So let's say that all together we find by times in the voltage times the current and the time that we end up with an energy of 8,880 joules. That's the number of joules of energy supplied to the iron block. Now this iron block is two kilograms, it's got two kilograms of mass. And the change in temperature, it went from 20 degrees to 30 degrees. So putting this in, to find our specific heat capacity, we know that we put 8,880 joules. Then we divide that by the mass, which is two, times the change in temperature, which is just gonna be 10. And that ends up being 444 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So there's another thing that's fairly similar called specific latent heat. Now I'm gonna put specific in brackets because sometimes you'll just see it called latent heat. And instead of this being the energy to raise the temperature of something, it's actually the energy required to melt or vaporize one kilogram of substance. In order to melt one kilogram of ice from solid to liquid, we need energy. And then if we've got liquid water to vaporize it, turn it into a gas, we need energy there as well. Whereas we say that the specific heat capacity of a substance is the same no matter what state it's in, solid, liquid or gas, the energy needed to melt a substance from solid to liquid is actually going to be different from the energy needed to vaporize it. So we do have latent heats of fusion, so that's going to be melting, and also we have latent heats of vaporization. So the energy required to melt something or vaporize something, that energy is going to be equals to the mass in kilograms times the latent heat, L. In order to find out the latent heat, all you have to do is find out the energy needed to melt something, then divide it by the mass of the substance that you were melting. The units of this, joules per kilogram. Or I can write it like this. Now then, let's say I put some ice inside of a kettle and I heat it up. Over time, the temperature of the ice is going to rise. But something weird happens when it hits zero degrees. Of course, it's going to melt, but for a period of time, the temperature actually stays constant. That's why it melts. Once all of the ice has melted, it carries on heating up. Then once it hits 100 degrees C, the same thing happens again. The temperature stays constant while it vaporizes, turns into a gas. If I had some way of heating it up even further, then I could raise the temperature of the water vapor as well. So here we have ice, here we have liquid water, and here we have vapor, water vapor. I don't really want to call it steam because, well, steam has little droplets of liquid water in as well, so we're just going to call it water vapor. Now, why is the temperature staying constant when it melts and why it's being vaporized? Here, the energy that we put in from the kettle is being used to raise the temperature. Here, before it can increase the temperature even further, the energy first has to break bonds in order to melt it or vaporize it here. So while melting or evaporating, the energy is used to break bonds, not raise the temperature. So that gives a constant temperature while all of the bonds are broken. If we were cooling something down, say we were cooling water vapor down, then we'd see the same thing again if we went backwards. The temperature would decrease, and then once it hit 100 degrees, we'd have a flat line. What's happening? Well. While it's cooling down, energy is being given out. 
Well, while it's condensing here, what's happening? Bonds are actually being remade. If bonds are being remade, then actually energy is given out from those bonds. So we end up with a constant temperature. Once all the bonds are remade, then it can carry on cooling down and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much where the GCSE ends. But with A level, you need to figure out how much energy is needed, not only to raise the temperature of something or melt it or vaporize it, but actually both at the same time. Let's say that we have ice at a certain temperature and we wanna find out how much energy it takes to get to here. It's gotta go from ice all the way to liquid water here. But in order to do that, it has to go through the process of being melted as well. So this energy is needed to raise the temperature and melt. Which formula do we use for raising temperature? We use SHC and melting, we use SLH. Now we could figure out what temperature it is from here to zero degrees, if it's water, and then find out how much energy it is to melt it, and then find out how much energy it is to raise the temperature up to here. But what we can do is go straight from here to here with our change in temperature. So that's gonna be M, C, delta T. I'm gonna call it a delta T, not delta theta. So that change in temperature is from here to here. And then we need to add on the energy needed to melt it as well. So that's just gonna be ML. And you can factorize this for the mass as well. The difficulty comes when you have questions where you have two objects that are transferring energy between each other and both of their temperatures are changing. So let's say we have a drink. I'm gonna say it's orange juice. So it has a different specific heat capacity to water. And we've got some ice in there as well. And I can say that my ice, when I put it in here, was minus five degrees C. We know that energy is gonna be given from the orange juice to the ice in order to melt it and also raise its temperature. So we're gonna end up ultimately at a common temperature. So how do we represent this and figure this out. What we can say is that for the orange juice, the energy that's given out when its temperature is decreased is gonna be M, the mass of the orange juice, times the specific heat capacity of the orange juice, times the temperature change. But we know whatever that temperature change is gonna be, it's gonna be 20 minus whatever the new temperature is. So let's call that T. What about the ice? We know that we have a certain mass of ice and that's got a certain specific heat capacity as well. And we know that we're gonna have a change in temperature as well. But whatever this change in temperature is, we know that it's going to end up at the same temperature as the orange juice ultimately. So we can put T in there as well. Then we can take away minus five. So we have the energy given out by the orange juice is gonna be given to the ice. But assuming that the ice turns into a liquid as well, which it probably will, we know that the energy is not only gonna be due to specific heat capacity, the raising of the temperature, but it's also gonna be equals to the energy needed to melt it. So we've just created an equation which we can then solve for the new common temperature. All you have to do is rearrange, get all the T's on one side, and then solve for T. Obviously, if you had two substances that didn't change state, then you wouldn't need that specific latent heat energy in there. We can just deal with our specific heat capacity energies instead. So it seems quite simple, but it's definitely one of those cases where practice, practice, practice is the key. So that's specific heat capacity and specific latent heat. I hope that helps. If it did, please leave a like. And if you have any questions or comments, then please leave them down below. And I'll see you next time.